Hi there, and welcome to another episode of Particle Physics Brick by Brick, where we're trying to explain as much about particle physics as we can using Lego. In this episode, we're going to be talking about beta decay. Now, in the episode on radioactivity, we discovered that beta decay was not as simple as the other radioactivities. In fact, it was transformative, transforming a neutron into a proton plus an electron. And the reason that we needed the electron to be ejected as well as the creation of the proton was to conserve electric charge. If we started with the zero electric charge, we had to end with zero electric charge. But this isn't the end of the story when it comes to beta decay. To unlock the secrets of beta decay, we need to talk about momentum conservation. Momentum is the product of an object's mass and its velocity. And momentum has to be the same before any incident and after any incident for a closed system of objects. This is one example of a conserved quantity in physics. Energy and electric charge are other examples. And if we have two objects here, mass one and mass two, and they're not doing anything, then they have zero velocity, which means that if we added together their momenta, m1 times zero, m2 times zero, then their momentum would be zero. If then there's an explosion between the two of them, which imparts an energy and therefore gives them a velocity, that would mean that they would have momentum, but their momentum would have to sum to zero. And the reason it can do so is because velocity is a vector quantity. Because the objects go off in opposite directions, one has to have a positive direction while the other has a negative direction and this is shown in the sum. If we rearrange that equation, we get the following relationship, that the magnitude of the momentum of object one must equal the magnitude of the momentum of object two in an explosion. Now the example I showed, mass one and mass two were identical. Now if this is the case, then it's clear to see that that would mean that the velocity of each of the objects would also have to be the same. But what if we had two objects where there was an imbalance in the mass? Say mass one was greater than mass two. Here when there was an explosion between them, there would be a different scenario because we would end up with the fact that if mass one was greater than mass two, then the velocity of object two, which is the lighter one, would have to be greater than the velocity of object one. Just to show you that simulation again, you see that object two goes off with a greater velocity than object one. That is because the product of the mass times velocity must be the same. And so if its mass is lower, then its velocity must be higher to make up for that shortfall. Now, if we go to the extreme, again, we're gonna look at an explosion between two objects, mass one and mass two. If we have this kind of explosion, the greater the imbalance in the mass, the greater the imbalance in the velocity of the object. So if mass one is much, much greater than mass two, then the velocity of object two will be much, much greater than the velocity of object one. But what's interesting is the energy that they are gaining and taking away is in the form of kinetic energy. And the kinetic energy equation is E equals a half mv squared. So if you do the algebra, you will see that the energy of object two must be greater than the energy of object one if they are to have the same momentum. Now let's go to beta decay. In beta decay, we've essentially got an explosion scenario because we're starting with a neutron. We can imagine that we're sat alongside the neutron and it is not moving. Then afterwards, there is a proton and an electron produced and they both gain energy from the beta decay. Now, because both of those start off, we can think with zero velocity, then gain that energy through the explosion, we can then say that the momentum of the proton must equal the magnitude of the momentum of the electron going off in the opposite direction if we are to have zero momentum after. Interestingly, the mass of the proton is about 2000 times the mass of the electron. So that's quite an imbalance. That means that the velocity the electron leaves of beta decay is 2000 times greater than the velocity a proton would leave from this beta decay. This would mean that the energy that the electron has is 2000 times greater than the energy of the proton. In beta decay, an electron takes away 99.95% of the energy that is released. That's all well and good, but you might be asking, where does this energy come from? Well, if we had a set of scales and we put a neutron on one side and a proton and an electron on the other, then the neutron would just tip the scales because the neutron has a greater mass than the proton and the electron combined. And it is from this difference in mass that we get the energy. Einstein's most famous equation, E equals mc squared, tells us that energy and mass are interchangeable. If there is a difference in mass or delta m, then that difference in mass must be released in the form of pure energy because it is no longer tied up in mass. This means that the energy that's released in beta decay is the difference in mass between the neutron, mn, 
and the proton plus electron mp and me. So the difference in mass times by the speed of light squared gives us the total energy that's released and it's this energy that goes into the kinetic energy of the particles. Well in fact pretty much to the kinetic energy of just the electron. Remember 99.95% at least. So that means that if we measure the energy of electrons that are coming from nuclei that are undergoing beta decay, we would expect the electron to come away with the same energy each time because it's related only to the difference in mass between the neutron and the proton and electron. So every time a neutron turned into proton and electron, we measure the energy of the electron and we would expect that every single electron would have pretty much the same energy and our graph would build in this way as we measured more and more electrons. But actually that was found to be incorrect. What was actually seen was that as a neutron turned into a proton and electron, the energy of the electrons took a wide variety of different energies. There were three possible explanations as to why this might be. One was that energy was not being conserved in beta decay, which seemed like a very bold step, considering it seems to be conserved in everything else that we see. Two, that momentum isn't conserved in beta decay. Again, a very bold step because momentum seems to be conserved everywhere else in physics. Or a third particle is being emitted. This third particle could take away a different proportion of the energy each time, leaving the electron with less energy than expected. Of course, nobody wanted to give up energy or momentum conservation, and so the idea of the third particle became the most prominent prediction, put forward in 1930 by Wolfgang Pauli as a desperate solution. But in fact, there was a third particle being emitted, and that became known as the neutrino, or little neutral one. In fact, the particle that's emitted in beta minus decay is the anti-electron neutrino. So we have our neutron, and we now know there are three particles that result in its decay. There is a proton, there is an electron and there is an anti-electron neutrino. And so this is our full equation for beta decay. Of course, the anti-electron neutrino must have zero for nucleon number and zero for proton number if it is not to affect the nuclear equation. And of course, this particle must have zero electric charge if it is not to affect the balance in electric charge before and after. What's happening at the fundamental particle level is that neutron is turning into a proton by turning a down quark into an up quark. And in the process then, there seems to be this electron and anti-electron neutrino emitted. And it seems that to turn a down quark into an up quark, we need to eject an electron and an anti-electron neutrino. But why? Why a pair of particles and why not just the electron if that's all we need to balance the electric charge? Well, therein lies the rub. There seems to be something else that needs to be conserved. In 1932, our picture of the universe changed dramatically with the discovery of antimatter. Antimatter was discovered because of the behavior of particles within magnetic fields. If I have a north pole here and on top of it I put a south pole such that my magnetic field is pointing out of my screen towards me, then the electron would curve in this direction because it has a negative electric charge. But what was seen in evidence from cosmic rays, high energy particles that are coming from above us, is that there seemed to be a particle that curved exactly the same amount as an electron, but in the opposite direction. Particle that had the same mass, but positive charge. This was the positron, the antimatter version of the electron, and it was discovered in 1932 by Carl Anderson. Now the positron is really the only antimatter particle with its own unique name, because it was the first antimatter particle to be discovered. All other fundamental particles just have the prefix anti put in front of them, so the anti-up quark, the anti-down quark, and the anti-neutrino for instance. This discovery was followed two years later by the discovery of beta plus decay. In normal beta decay, which we will now call beta minus decay, a neutron turned into a proton producing an electron and an anti-electron neutrino. But in beta plus decay, a proton changes into a neutron producing a positron, antimatter version of the electron, and an electron neutrino. Again, the electric charge is balanced. And we can see if we start with a positive one proton, we have to end with the charge of positive one afterwards. And the way in which we achieve this is we have a positron which has a plus one charge, while the neutron and the neutrino both have zero in electric charge. This was discovered in 1934 by Irene and Frederick Joliot Curie. And interestingly, the same year, Enrico Fermi came up with his first theory of the weak nuclear force. Essentially what's happening in beta plus decay is that this proton is turning into a neutron because an up quark is being turned into a down quark 
and in the process, a positron and electron neutrino are also emitted. And so it seems that not only can we flip a down quark into an up quark, but we can flip the coin the other way and flip an up quark into a down quark. But when we do this, we have to emit the antimatter versions of both the electron and the anti-electron neutrino. This seems to suggest that whatever is going on not only pairs the up and down quarks together, but also seems to pair the electron and the neutrino in some way. And so what is this pairing? What is the reason behind the neutrino being needed for balancing the equations. What is the weak charge that needs to be conserved in the same way that the electric charge has to be conserved? This will be explained in the video on the weak force. Thanks for listening. If you would like to know more, subscribe to my YouTube channel or follow me on social media for more information. You could also buy the book. Particle Physics Brick by Brick is available through online retailers and many local bookstores. Other languages are also available. If you follow this bit.ly link, you can also get access to lots of educational resources and information on where you can get your hands on LEGO to play along. LEGO is a registered trademark of the LEGO Group, which does not sponsor, authorise or endorse these videos in any way.